Here is the incredible but true story of the USS Hornet CV-8, one of the first aircraft carriers lost in the Pacific during World War II. She is famous for launching the secretive Doolittle Raid on Tokyo and participated in the Battle of Midway, the buen Ficey tonali Raid, and the capture and defense of Guadalcanal. During the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands, the Hornet was pummeled by torpedoes, bombs, kamikazes, and raked with gunfire. She struggled to stay afloat, but her damage was too severe, and on October 26, 1942, she sunk beneath the seas to permanently rest on Iron Bottom Sound. The Hornet was in service for a year and six days and was the last U.S. fleet carrier to ever be sunk by enemy fire. In late January 2019, her wreckage was finally discovered at a depth of more than 17,500 feet off the Solomon Islands. We present this program to you so that we may never forget the courage of those who fought for our freedoms. To Washington and the world from Tokyo on April 18, 1942, came the most startling war news since December 7th. News of the bombing by U.S. planes of the capital of the Empire of Japan. News soon followed by a statement from the president that the planes had taken off from a mysterious base identified only as Shangri-La. But what and where this Shangri-La was remained for a year a closely guarded military secret. And then in April 1943, when news came again from Tokyo, this time grim news, that the enemy had assassinated some of the brave soldier flyers who had soared to destiny from Shangri-La, it was finally revealed that mysterious Shangri-La had been a United States aircraft carrier, the now famous USS Hornet. To everyone in America who learned about Shangri-La, but especially to those workers who had built the Hornet and thus considered it their ship, the story of the Hornet has a special meaning. These were the men and women who, in 1940, had worked on her hull at Newport News, Virginia. Other thousands of them had rolled her steel in Gary and in Pittsburgh. Still others in Schenectady had built her great turbines, while Bethlehem, Pennsylvania had milled the close tolerances of her guns. Age or race or creed had made no difference. It was skill and speed, the effort and determination with which each worker made the big things and made the small that counted on the Hornet. She was launched in December 1940 ahead of schedule. One of the Hornet workers said, She had character, that ship. She was rugged, built from the ground up like a heavyweight champ. She was a special ship to us because we had worked on her for over a year and a half. A man who builds a ship gets to have a pride in her, just as strong a pride as have the officers and men who take her into action. We knew that we had made her a good ship and that she would do a job wherever she would fight. And that's the way we felt about the Hornet. They finished fitting her out nine months ahead of schedule. Thousands of products from workers and suppliers in every state of the land went into the Hornet. Almost every worker in the country was, in one way or another, a partner in fitting out the Hornet. The Navy had planned everything so that wherever in the world she was to go into battle, the right tool would be found ready at the right time and in the right place. And the sons and brothers of many an American worker were to man the Hornet, were to fly her planes and fire her guns and drive her into battle. On October 20th, 1941, the officers and men of the Hornet stood to attention, smartly in Navy fashion, as their captain took command and as the Secretary of the Navy spoke to them of the job to be done. 
We're holding this little ceremony, which makes of the Hornet the seventh of its name, a ship of the Navy. I think you officers and men of the Hornet are especially to be congratulated that you man a ship which represents the last word, the latest development in the most recent arm of our service. And so as you become a part of the fleet, as the civilian head of that organization, I give you a fervent God bless you and God go with you. Then at sea on her shakedown cruise came weeks of training, never-ending flight operations for the squadrons and for the ship's company. The Hornet, her planes and her men were learning to fight as a team, learning to rely on each other and on the machines American workers at home had built for them. The planes took off from dawn until dark, day after day, to fly patrols, to hunt for the enemy, but above all, to practice again and again the complex operations which combine air fighting with sea fighting. Landing at sea is a fine art which depends on perfect teamwork between the pilot and the signal officer. Once in a while a plane went into the gallery. But practice makes perfect in training aviators and the captain kept the planes coming aboard until landings under all conditions became second nature to the flyers and to the men of the ship. Hornet was getting ready to engage the enemy. And then in April 1942, Colonel Jimmy Doolittle of the Army and his bomber squadron came aboard and the Hornet headed west. The 16 big B-25 bombers were lashed securely to the deck. The Hornet's men got along famously with the Army. They realized the importance of the Army Flyer's mission. The sailors liked the idea of the Colonel returning to the Mikado with Captain Mitcher's respects, a medal with which the Emperor had once decorated the Captain. On the 18th of April, 800 miles from the shores of Japan, on the carrier's deck as she bit into the choppy waves, the army planes were made ready for their takeoff. Each of them weighed 27,000 pounds and had a wing spread of almost 68 feet, only a few feet less than the width of the ship itself. A crew member telling his part of the story later said, On the takeoff, the wing tips hung over the port side and the starboard cleared the island structure by only three or four feet. The planes were airborne even before they reached the end of the flight deck. Colonel Doolittle dipped his wings to Admiral Halsey, and to us, and disappeared into the clouds. We gave them all a cheer and wished them good luck because we knew where they were going, Tokyo. The mission these bombers then completed brought war and destruction to the cities of the enemy. And as the carrier and its task force turned away into the Pacific, there arose the famous legend about Hornet, the legend of Shangri-La. And later aboard the Hornet came the men of Torpedo Squadron 8, who would take the battle to the enemy at Midway. Of the 30 officers and men who flew off the Hornet in this squadron, only Ensign George Gay was to return. Radio man George Field on his left would be killed. Ensign Gay said, Here's our skipper, Lieutenant Commander John Charles Waldron and Horace Dobbs as rear seat gunner. They would be killed. And so would Lieutenant Jimmy Owens, our exec, and Emilio Maffey. 
My friend Ensign Plywood Teats would die, and so would Hollis Martin. And Ensign Bill Robinson from Boston would meet his end with Ross Bibb. All except me in a hot few minutes. We roared off the Hornet for the Battle of Midway on June 4th, 1942. I'll never forget the last thing our skipper said. I want each of us to do his utmost to destroy our enemies. If there's only one plane left to make the final run in, I want that man to go in and get a hit. May God be with us all. Good luck, happy landings, and give them hell. Attack was the watchword of Torpedo 8, and attack was in the minds of the men of the Hornet, who, over the radio, listened to the planes of Torpedo 8 as they went in for their last attack against four big Japanese carriers. Midway was one of the great naval victories of all time and forestalled an invasion of the continental United States. And in this victory, Torpedo 8 set an example of daring and of faith which should inspire all Americans. Those who died in the Battle of Midway were true sons of the Navy and true sons of the Hornet. After Midway, Hornet seldom returned to its base at Pearl Harbor. She was always at sea, constantly searching for the enemy. The crew exercised daily out on the flight deck in the open air and kept in fine physical shape. For when you're on a fighting ship, you never can tell when you're going to need all the strength you've got. Gunnery officers went over the guns again and again, analyzing the lessons learned at Midway. For having tasted blood at Midway, each gun captain wanted his crew to be the best on the ship. There was seldom any time for loafing, always a job to be done. Sometimes at night below decks for those off watch, there would be some relaxing in the wardroom. But elsewhere in the ship, the endless training would go on and on and on as they sought for an almost impossible perfection. And then, it came, October 26, 1942, the day of the Battle of Santa Cruz. A sailor said, We were at battle stations in condition one long before dawn. Our planes took off in the half light, just at daybreak. About 0900, word came from our air group to expect a large number of Jap bombers. We stood by for the attack. The first of the Japs came into range about 0930, and our gunners opened fire. There were two different attacks during the day. And every Jap plane that got through our fighter screen was shot down by the Hornet's guns. 26 of them in 10 hours. a torpedo on the starboard side had smashed our engine room. And in the second attack, the Japs hit us with everything in the book, bombs and torpedoes at the same time. But our gunners continued to pump lead into the Japs, adding to our score, plane by plane. Three Japs crashed aboard and started fires. With the engine room out, our power was gone. We lost steerage way and listed heavily to starboard. Later, during a lull in the battle, we organized bucket brigades. We flooded port compartments, but still listed to starboard 18 degrees. Knowing that we were in range of land-based Japanese bombers, and that it would no longer be possible to fight a ship that couldn't be righted, our skipper ordered us to abandon ship. 
We went over the side around 1700 and were taken aboard the rescue ship standing by. You could see our hornet lying out there, deserted and sort of lonely. Somehow she seemed to struggle to stay alive. We hated to leave her. But the skipper knew best. And just as night came down to make her death quick and merciful, our captain ordered our own gunners to shell her and torpedo her. We knew how he must have felt giving orders to sink our ship when she had fought bravely in so many battles and had in her career shot down scores of Jap planes and damaged or sunk about 50,000 tons of enemy merchant shipping and over 200,000 tons of Jap warships. Next day, our wounded were transferred from the rescue ships to other ships that would take them home. Handling the stretchers was a good job of seamanship. And as each stretcher came aboard, some sailor would recognize a shipmate he'd been wondering about since we'd abandoned ship. The Hornet was gone. She'd been our home for over a year. In her, we'd lost something that had been part of us. But she would be remembered no matter on what other ships we were to serve. We knew that we had fought the Hornet well, that we had brought destruction to the enemy at Tokyo and Midway, at Guadalcanal, at Ricotta Bay, in the Coral Sea, and at Santa Cruz. She was a great fighting ship. And the fighting spirit of the Hornet lives on in her men as they go out in the new ships now being built by thousands of workers who are fighting the battle of production here at home in the same spirit as the Hornet fought the Japs. Today the Navy must have many ships and planes, many other ships like the Hornet, great ships to drive deep into the waters of Japan, where from these new Shangri-Las, our enemy will feel again and again the full striking force of the Navy and of the workers behind it. The sting of the Hornet. United States aircraft carrier Hornet, part of a task force steaming into Japanese waters, is now revealed as the secret base from which American planes first bombed Tokyo. Here is that secret airfield. 16 B-25s, twin-motored army bombers, lashed to the Hornet's flight deck. The dramatic saga of a combined Army-Navy mission that brought panic to Japan and stirred the world for its brilliance and daring. Colonel Doolittle, now a major general, assembles his 80 volunteers before the flight. Not until this moment is their objective revealed, the heart of the island empire. A fitting touch. Japanese medals awarded United States officers for humanitarian aid to the Japanese people are returned attached to 500-pound bonds. Now, in heavy seas, some 800 miles off Japan, enemy patrol boats are sighted and sunk. Survivors are picked up and put aboard a cruiser. Fearing they have radioed Tokyo a warning, Doolittle decided to take off 10 hours ahead of schedule. Plans are changed on an hour's notice. Motors begin to warm up. Never before have big loaded bombers been launched in such numbers from a carrier at sea. For months they've trained secretly. Now for the test. Doolittle's plane is first down the runway. The commander leading the flight. As the carrier plows through heavy seas, 
one bomber after another soars from the flight deck, pointed for Japan. sets its course for carefully prearranged military objectives in Japan, a course that will put them over Tokyo at high noon in broad daylight. The Yokosuka naval base ablaze, arms plants, rail yards, and oil refineries smashed by the raiders in Tokyo, Yokohama, Kobe, and Osaka. journey's end for the great adventure. Fuel gone, 15 of the planes are wrecked as their crews are forced to bail out over China and Japanese-occupied territory. The Japanese government flatly admits that of eight uniformed flyers captured, some have been executed. This in flagrant violation of all international law. 64 of the 80 men who took off were rescued, and most of them have returned to duty. In Chongqing, Madam Chiang Kai-shek honored Doolittle and his gallant men for a raid that did much to shake the complacency of the Japanese warlord. 